The Game Boy Advance has so many good games on it, and they even managed to outlast the console that they were made for. Thanks to Nintendo's keen interest in backwards compatibility for their handheld systems, the Nintendo DS gave players access to not just the newest DS titles, but they could continue to enjoy the backlog of games released for the GBA. A godsend for many, particularly those strapped for cash, as having a new system that could play older games means that the legacy of some of the Game Boy Advance's most iconic titles could live on with those who have a tight budget, or who were simply curious about the past. They could try out great games like WarioWare, Castlevania Circle of the Moon, Fire Emblem, Zelda the Minish Cap and Four Swords, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, and even Pokemon's Pinball spin-off. These are just some of the titles we'll be talking about in this episode, with our first splash landing in the world of microgame mania. WarioWare Inc. Mega Microgames was a pretty dramatic change for Wario's position within Nintendo's library of games, giving him his own incredibly distinct cast of supporting characters, and leaving players with no mistakes that Wario is a comedic element of the Mario franchise. That humor can be found throughout WarioWare, and ranges from being on the nose to being pretty well hidden, such as one reference that requires some extra effort one may not think to put in. After clearing the first set of Wario's microgames, the player can then play them again endlessly. Doing so means that the player can repeatedly beat the boss of this stage, which will present them with a short animation of Wario resting on a sofa watching TV. It's actually possible for the player to turn the TV on during this animation by pressing the A button, revealing what Wario is watching. After beating the boss on the third difficulty cycle, the words thank you for playing appears instead of rest, and by turning on the TV, a smartly dressed businessman with glasses will be revealed. Though this isn't, of course, just any businessman, it is in fact the great iconic visage of the late Nintendo president Satoru Iwata. But this isn't the game's only secret. Another reference comes in during the staff roll, which lets the player change the shape of stars that fly past the screen through button inputs. If the player press down the down button on the game's controller, the stars will turn into small triforces from the Legend of Zelda series, while pressing the right direction will change them into the GameCube logo instead. Another series that made quite the impression on GBA is Konami's Castlevania series, and Circle of the Moon has its own reference to another, earlier title released by the publisher, though this time around, some players may have never even known the game they were referencing. A wearable item dropped by the skeleton medalist is the Bear Ring, a ring which the game describes as holding the Curse of the Bear. It may appear to be a rather useless item all in all, providing them with a loss of 100 strength, defense, intelligence, and luck, suggesting the player shouldn't use it for lack of any real benefit. However, if the player does equip this item at the same time as activating the dual setup combination of Pluto and Black Dog, rather than the usual effect of turning into a skeleton, they will instead turn into a cartoonish green bear called Bear Tank. Bear Tank is actually a character that appeared in an earlier Konami title, Rakuga Kids, a 2.5D fighting game released for the Nintendo 64 in 1998. We actually covered the game on region, if you want to check it out. The game was only ever published in Japan and PAL territories, so he's not too recognizable to US audiences, but he has made appearances in other Konami titles as well, including Konami Crazy Racers for GBA. This transformation in Circle of the Moon is considered to actually still be pretty useless, as though it does have some unique and rather interesting attacks, his damage is still well below that of Nathan's human form, and he will die in just a single blow. In reality, this item is nothing more than a joke, but as a lover of the bear tank, we can't say it's an unwelcome one. Another series of games which had little acknowledgement overseas is the legendary Starfy series, probably as a result of most of the games in the series never getting an international release. The first game, Densetsu no Starfy, originally began its life being developed for the Game Boy all the way back in 1995, before eventually having development moved to the Game Boy Color in 1998, before it was shifted once again, shortly before its completion, to the new GBA hardware in 1999. Because of all of these shifts in the game's long production, it wasn't even released until 2002, a seven-year development period. 
The series as a whole wouldn't have any release in the West at all until the fifth entry on the Nintendo DS, released as the legendary Staffy. But one of Staffy's adventures on the GBA did have some recognizable faces in it. In Densetsu no Staffy 3, Wario himself is prominently featured within the game's eighth world, giving them treasures such as a copy of WarioWare Inc. with an actual GBA and teaching Staffy how to use his shooting star ability. Moving from an obscure franchise to a huge one, Nintendo had a pretty rocky start with its international adoption of the Fire Emblem franchise. Even when Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade managed to be localized around the globe, it still found itself in a spot of bother, with every version of the game having its own unique errors in their dialogue. In the original Japanese version, Lin as a Blade Lord will incorrectly be shown using her regular battle sprites and animations if she is wielding the Soul Katai as a result of the animations being assigned to Durandal. This error was fixed when the game was localized elsewhere, but other issues will crop up instead. With the North American release of the game, all dialogue mentioning Aenir has some sort of translation error, with the character sometimes being referred to as a location instead of a person. One character straight up says, Daddy has to go to Aenir, I'm going to get Mummy. But the issues don't just stop there, as the English language mode of both European releases adds its own unusual error on the world map sequence of Chapter 16XE or 17XH, where the game's script will suddenly drop the English language in place of Italian. This mistake isn't that the game suddenly points the game to read from the Italian language script instead, but rather it is part of the English text, as it even occurs in another release of the game in Europe which didn't actually include an Italian language option. Fire Emblem may be huge these days, but an even bigger Nintendo series is The Legend of Zelda. Unused code is always fun to unearth in games, and one particularly fun game is the Minish Cap. Lon Lon Milk makes an appearance in this pocket adventure, which serves only to heal the player out in the field, but it seems as though there may have been another function for this item entirely in earlier builds. Unused data suggests that, at least at one stage, Link would have been able to churn Lon Lon Milk into butter, with a chunk of unused text which reads, Your Lon Lon Milk turned into butter. It's very fresh and delicious. With that said, the conditions required to turn the milk into butter aren't made obvious, but it would seem likely that Link was supposed to have taken the Lon Lon milk to a particular character to have it churned, but who that is isn't all too clear. It's possible that they too were also removed before the game's final release, but one Minish found in the Minish village can produce Picolite for Link, a substance that increases the rate of finding certain items. To create a variety of different colors of Picolite and make them available for Link to purchase, the player must bring them the correct ingredients, with one of these ingredients being Long Long Milk, in order to unlock Yellow Picolite. This is a particularly interesting item to have to deliver, as it isn't particularly hard to come by, unlike the rest of the items needed for the other colors. So it may be that in an early version of the game, Link would have had to churn Lon Lon Milk into Lon Lon Butter and deliver it to unlock Yellow Picolite instead. The Minish Cap also has many connections with another Zelda title on GBA, Four Swords. One of the new enemies created for Four Swords was the rather irritating Rupee Wraith, a ghost-like creature that pursues Link after being let out of its treasure chest hiding spot. Rather than take out Link's health, the Wraith instead starts to drain the player's Rupee count, but the Rupee Wraith actually makes another appearance in the Minish Cap. There was a different being entirely, sharing a sprite with the ghost which haunts Greagle. The Rupee Wraith's squealing sounds can also be heard in the Minish Cap, having been given to the big Octorok boss. But other data from Four Swords appears in the Minish Cap, though goes entirely unused. Both Zoles and Gels appear to have been considered for the game at some stage, but they remain dormant in Minish Cap's data. One interesting tidbit comes from the Zol boss of Four Swords. An interesting part of this boss comes in its name, Dera Zol, with Dera appearing to be a shortening of Dorai, a Japanese word for immense or awesome, meaning this boss's name essentially translates into Awesome Zol. The Bomberosa enemy also has an interesting name, originating from the term Bomberosa, which when translated from Italian means Red Bomb. 
though this name is only used in the game's English localization. In fact, not only is this name used in the game's English releases, but the Italian translation of the game actually uses the original Japanese name, Bombu, possibly to obscure the enemy's name from being a bit too obvious to Italian speakers. Now, the Game Boy Advance's Pokemon offerings saw massive success, like it had before and as it would continue to do. But before we dive into those mainline titles, let's take a look at a spin-off that sold well in its own right. Many have fond memories of playing Pokemon Pinball, Ruby and Sapphire on their GBAs in the early 2000s. And by many, we mean a great deal, with the game selling around a million units worldwide. But there was another version of this game, a far, far more exclusive experience that only a few got to try. At least one full-size pinball machine based on the game was produced by Personal Pinball Link for Pokemon USA. It was ultimately housed at the New York Pokemon Center, and Personal Pinball were so proud of it, they featured it on their company flyer. This physical version seems to take elements from both boards featured in the GBA game. As for the game that this pinball spin-off is based on, Ruby and Sapphire showed a resurging presence in 2020 as well, all thanks to a pair of fish. In May 2020, a Japanese live streamer began a lengthy series using his two pet Siamese fighting fish to play through Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire using a system involving several programs connected to the game's emulator. These programs rely on a webcam to track the fish's movements and determine what individual action to perform by where it swims over a map placed behind the fish tank. So wherever the fish swims, it blocks a map square with a picture of a controller input on it and the system performs said input in the game. On October 3rd, 2020, during a live stream of Pokemon Sapphire, one of the fish was working on a boulder puzzle in the seafloor cavern on Route 128 when it performed a very rare glitch that appeared to have not been widely known in the past. The fish used strength on a boulder, which moved it and additionally created a duplicate boulder in its place, making the puzzle unsolvable until the room was reset. The streamer later figured out how to trigger the glitch himself, and uploaded a step-by-step -step guide to YouTube on how to perform it. Amazingly, another fish that belonged to the owner found another glitch a few months later. This time, the glitch happened during a stream of Pokemon Crystal, where the player picked up an item through a wall. The Game Boy was revolutionary. It took gaming on the go and it had some killer games to boot. The only real problems with the system was that it wasn't exactly pocket friendly and you couldn't see the screen if you had no external lighting. This is often riffed on, but it seems a pretty glaring issue with the system and viewing the Game Boy games through a modern lens really paints the experience in a different light. But regardless, the games were solid and Nintendo's first party offerings were quite remarkable all things considered. Mario's Picross, Donkey Kong Land, Metroid 2, Link's Awakening and Pokemon Gold and Silver demonstrated that great products can come in compact sizes, if you consider the OG Game Boy to actually be compact that is. The experiences of these games may have been limited by hardware, but their design was top notch, meaning that they continue to see relevance in later years, with Metroid 2 even getting a full remake treatment for the 3DS in 2017. But the idea of remaking the game was much older than that, with the original Game Boy releasing back in the early 90s, Retro Studios had considered remaking the game as early as the mid 2000s. Ben Sprout, an artist with Retro Studios, posted on his WordPress blog in 2009 in response to a Metroid 2 fan remake of the game being released online, stating, I've always thought it would be awesome to remake Metroid 2. A group of us at Retro even discussed doing it as a side project at one point. Nothing ever came of it, though I still think it'd be fun to remake it as a 3D side scroller. Another name which appears in Metroid 2's credits is Dylan. Cuthbert, widely recognized for his work as the main programmer on the original Star Fox release for the Super Nintendo. In Metroid 2, he receives a name drop under the Special Thanks section, which according to Cuthbert in a 2016 interview, is thanks to the work he did assisting the team, providing programming advice and helping with the game's optimization while he was working on his own title, X, also released for the Game Boy. Speaking of which, X is an important game in and of itself. In order for Dylan to create X, his team at Argonaut had to create their own Game Boy development kit, a task that was not so simple to achieve. 
According to Dylan, we hacked together a Game Boy development kit with a camera pointed at the Game Boy. They'd gotten it into circuit printing and were printing the circuit boards in this bath full of acid. We're not certain, but X may well be the only game that came to be partly thanks to a bathtub full of acid. Our next Game Boy title is Mario's Picross, a great little puzzle game which stood the test of time. This is another Nintendo title that had a whole bunch of changes when it was brought to the West. These included a number of changes to the puzzles, altering what the player must draw out on the Picross boards. One of these was the alteration for a puzzle featuring a picture of a cocktail drink, which was changed into that of a Boo character from the Mario series, essentially changing Boos into a Boo. It seems Nintendo's main focus was on removing references to alcohol, like with another puzzle that was changed from a glass of wine into a hat, or a mug of beer that was turned into a crow. References to the Buddhist religion were also removed by placing a Buddhist bell with some garlic. A similar change happens with what seems to be a Buddhist guardian, Neo, being swapped out with chili peppers. References to Japanese culture were also changed to more universally recognized images, with the removal of a Japanese tea kettle for a much more recognizable burger, and the change of a hand drum and yokai to popular animals. Another puzzle was changed to remove a cigarette, which is a surprising image to include in the first place, considering it's a game for all ages. Other changes include a toy puzzle having been turned into a unicorn, and despite efforts to distance the game from religious iconography, a fan puzzle was turned into an angel. We also just wanted to quickly say that we're giving away a Nintendo Switch OLED edition on our second channel. There's details on that in the description. And we're also moving a lot of the sort of trivia you'll find in these extra videos over to TikTok, so be sure to give us a follow using the links in the video description. Now, back to the trivia. When it comes to creating a new title for the Game Boy, it makes sense to work on a game specifically designed for pocket adventures, with inspirations coming from games on home consoles. However, while Donkey Kong Land wound up being an entirely unique game in its own right, the original plan was for the game to be a straight-up port of one of the SNES's most graphically impressive titles, Donkey Kong Country. Programmer Paul Mahacek, however, managed to convince higher-ups at Rare that a new, original title would make more financial sense, saying, Whenever anyone asked me to convert a console game onto Game Boy, I expressed the opinion that we'd be better off writing a new game in the same vein, and that the extra resources to do that wouldn't be much greater than for doing a port, whilst not limiting your market and reducing its size to those people who hadn't just bought the console game. It was a point of view I expressed in 1994 when I was asked to port DKC and instead wrote DKL for Game Boy. This was also a sentiment that Cranky Kong would get behind, as Donkey Kong Land's manual expressed the whole game was made after Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong had a bet with Cranky that they could have fun even without fancy graphics and modern music. Despite this point, however, the original Donkey Kong Country was given a port to the handheld's mid-generation upgrade, the Game Boy Color, albeit a whole five years after Donkey Kong Land. Another one of Donkey Kong Land's secrets is that the game was originally going to feature a new animal buddy called Rambunctious. Little is known about what this little fellow could do, and why he never made it into the game, just that they were, you know, a ram. Maybe they were just a little bit sheepish. Hearing from developers who worked on our favorite games gives us some great insight into game creation, a job which for many may seem like a dream come true until you find yourself on the other side. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening was a game that certainly delivered joy to many players, but in the files from the Giga Leaks a couple of years ago, a development note from one of the game's programmers revealed some more sentiments around their work at Nintendo over the years. Left by programmer Kazuaki Morita, the note titled Bearded Uncle goes on to talk about his experience working with Nintendo and his thoughts as he moves forward in his career. It reads, I think there are jobs game developers will never forget, in the same way that people who fish remember their first catch, regardless of its size. For me, it's Super Mario Bros. It had a huge 32 kilobyte programming area for the time, and I packed in nearly that much. It was a big fuss, even if you had a few free bytes. Then the infinite lives, the minus world, I think the word tricks started being used around this time. I'm relieved they're not always called bugs. It's been about eight years since then, and I've been involved in various other games, but as I get older, I feel my head is spinning and my memory is weakening. However, I think that my slyness has been only further enhanced. It is often said that a programmer's life is up to 30 years long, 
but that's just a social custom, saying it happens because you don't have to work when really it's that you are unable to work. And I think I might quit this job if I feel I've reached my limit, since there's no such thing as a programmer who cannot program. You may be pleased to hear that Kazuaki would stick with Nintendo for many years after Link's Awakening was released, mostly sticking to work on the Zelda franchise as a programmer, though in recent years taking on more roles as a supervisor, possibly starting to feel his age when it comes to his programming tricks. What would a variety of Nintendo games be without the mention of Pokemon? Pokemon Gold, Silver and Crystal came after Red and Blue, so players were of course expecting some riveting new features to their grand adventure. It turns out that there was a feature set to change the game's immersive experience, giving the player a sense of being in the Pokemon world, but it was removed before the game's final release, a fully functional feature that allowed the player to name their mother. This function was included in the data of the Space World 97 demo of the game, which offers the choice of calling your mother Mother, Mama, Mommy, or the option of giving her the name of your choice. A curiosity around this data takes place during the demo's Pokemon Catching tutorial, however, in which the player's name is copied to the same location in the game's RAM as the mother's name is stored, suggesting that, by the time Nintendo had finished creating the game's tutorial, the mechanism of naming the mother was already planned to go unused. Another bit of interesting content can be found within the game's data. Interestingly, all 26 forms of unknown have shiny variants, but only the unknown that are shaped like an I and a V can be shiny. This is, by complete coincidence, due to both how unknown forms and shininess are dependent on IVs. This means that there are 24 forms of unknown which have unused shiny variants. We love the Nintendo 64 and its pool of high quality exclusives, but not everyone did. Even in its heyday, the system was seen as a misstep by many and was the beginning of the Nintendo mentality. Many developers shifted away from Nintendo and moved instead onto Sony's newest competitor, the PlayStation. This was primarily because Sony's system was substantially easier to work with and its disc based games were much cheaper to produce. The PS1 was also seen as more mature, catering to an adult audience who had disposable income, with Sony being more comfortable with adult content like blood or violence in their games. That isn't to say that the Nintendo 64 didn't have some incredible games, but it was definitely a period when Nintendo were not leading the industry in sales or user mindshare. However, one area Nintendo excelled at in this era was gameplay innovation, and the games they released for the N64 almost always set the benchmark of quality in their respective genres. High-octane racing games like F-Zero X and 1080 Snowboarding, the birth of 3D platforming in Super Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie, epic adventures like Ocarina of Time, party time classics like Mario Party 2 or Smash Bros, and even film tie-ins like Star Wars Racer or Rogue Squadron can all be found on the system, and we'll be talking about many of these games in today's episode. We'll start with arguably the most extreme of these games and hit the dusty slope of 1080 Snowboarding, Nintendo's answer to the SSX franchise. 1080 Snowboarding has its fair share of cameo appearances, not that surprising for a Nintendo game. The Big N wanted to include some of their iconic characters within the game's tundra, and as such, added their iconic mascots, Mario and Luigi, among the crowd of spectators within the game. Mario and Luigi can be seen in a fairly realistic depiction, donning their signature coloured overalls. They are so incredibly well hidden. A perhaps lesser known character from Nintendo's history also makes an appearance on the Golden Forest track, though this is incredibly easy to miss. Hidden off to one side, watching the player cruise down the mountain, is a man donning what can either be some fishing or hunting gear alongside his canine companion. This same graphic makes an appearance in Wave Race 64. These cameos are so incredibly well hidden, it's almost surprising anybody actually wound up noticing them at all. Another well-hidden secret can be found stored away in the data of Super Mario 64. Before the release of the final game, a demonstration was made playable at the Shoshinkai 1995 trade show, an event that had later be renamed Nintendo Space World. Nintendo clearly created a simple level select menu for this event, made ready only a month before the show took place. Normally, data created for the sole purpose of a demo wouldn't be found in the final retail build of a title, but located at the start of the game's text data in all localized versions of the game are the remains of this basic level select. 
This is a separate level select from a fully functional one created for the purpose of the developers debugging the game, with the levels not having their final names, and instead using much earlier ones. These are Mountain, which became Womp's Fortress, Fire Bubble, which became Lethal Lava Land, Snow Slider, which became Cool Cool Mountain, Waterland, which became Dire Dire Docks, and Cooper No. 1, which became Bowser in the Dark World. The N64 also had some top-notch third-party titles. The Star Wars video games aren't by any means a bad bunch, with titles like Episode 1 Racer being fondly remembered, but the game wasn't always going to simply be called Star Wars Episode 1 Racer, but rather Star Wars Episode 1 Pod Racer as would be a much more fitting title. However, it was unfortunate that there was already another sci-fi racing game out at the same time for Windows PCs published by Ubisoft, called Planet of Death, which was abbreviated to POD for the North American market. With this, Ubisoft had actually trademarked the word pod in any form of interactive entertainment, so the team behind Episode 1 Racer decided to play it safe and turn Episode 1 Pod Racer to just Episode 1 Racer. Another Star Wars title on the Nintendo 64 was Rogue Squadron, which released before the film's Episode 1 prequel, but this didn't stop the team from inserting some secrets that wouldn't be seen by players and even a good chunk of the game's development staff until after The Phantom Menace's release. By entering the password Halifax question mark and then exclamation mark Ingve exclamation mark while also ignoring the incorrect password entry noises, it's possible to unlock and play as a Naboo starfighter from The Phantom Menace. Having been published six months before the prequel, the code had to be kept secret, only being revealed to the public after the film was released. As for the second code of this unlockable, Ingve, this was taken from the Swedish musician Ingve Malmsteen. If anybody knows why this is, however, we're all is, as this seems like a, a, an entirely random choice. From pod racing to a different kind of futuristic racing, it's time to talk about F-Zero X. The Giga Leak of 2020 revealed a whole lot of weird data for a good bundle of Nintendo games, but one of the things revealed from this leak is related to F-Zero X. Two pictures can be found within a set of early graphics for the title, which seem entirely unrelated to Nintendo, never mind the F-Zero series. The first of these images is of Beavis from the animated show Beavis and Butthead, specifically the head of a 1998 more action collectibles toy of the character. The second image is simply the same as the first one, slightly enlarged, and with its colors inverted, because if anything is going to scream the 90s at you, it's not only Beavis and Butthead, but also an image that uses the fancy new visual effect of inverted colors. But even the final build of F-Zero X has a hidden secret within its data that can be used with the help of an additional piece of hardware, a DYKG favorite, the Nintendo 64 DD Expansion Kit. By attaching this expansion to the N64 console and playing F-Zero X, a completely unique musical track will play on the Rainbow Road level. This is a specially composed alternative arrangement of the Mario Kart 64 Rainbow Road theme. Glorious. Now this next piece is so quintessentially British that it couldn't come from anywhere but rare. Gruntilda is the primary antagonist of the Banjo-Kazooie series, but the origin of her full name may escape many. Gruntilda Winky Bunyan. The Gruntilda portion comes from the series composer Grant Kirkhope, who would sometimes be referred to as Grunt instead of Grant, simply slapping a tilde on the end for a more feminine name makes sense. As for Winky Bunyan, a surname that is only revealed during the boss fight in Banjo-Tooie, some Brits may have already clocked the name. This name is based on British slang for both a penis and a wart, respectively. Winky and Bunyan. Despite this fact, however, the game was still given an E rating by the ESRB, perhaps having missed the rather crass reference. Rare seemed to enjoy the term Winky around the office, as they would even sometimes refer to Steve Malus as Winky Boy. Another secret nod to the team can be found in Banjo-Tooie, where the combination code to obtain the Jiggy belonging to Super Stash the Safe in Cloud Cuckoo Land's Central Cave is 1984, a number which the safe describes as a rare date. This is indeed a rare date, and references the year Rare as a Company was founded, 1984. 
Mario Party 2 has a huge number of references to not just pop culture, but even real-life culture sprinkled throughout. If the player refuses Wiggler's Hootenanny offer, she will say, Y'all come back now, ya hear? A much-quoted line originally delivered by Jed Clampett in the TV series The Beverly Hillbillies. Santa spell. Take your shoes off. Y'all come back now, hear? Woody the Tree's Japanese name is also a reference, being Kinokyo, originating from the word ki, meaning tree, and Pinocchio, the famous story of a living wooden boy. This isn't the only famous old story referenced, such as with the Japanese name for the skeleton ki, where it is called Akazuki-chan, which effectively translates into Little Ki Riding Hood. Akazu, meaning do not open, ki, meaning, well, ki, and Akazukin, meaning Little Red Riding Hood. In terms of references to the real world, the menu icon for the Mystery Land board seems to resemble the Condor figure found at the Nazca Lines, a collection of ancient geoglyphs carved into the soil of the Nazca Desert, located in southern Peru. The Boo Bell may also be a reference to the practice of burying the dead with a bell tied to a piece of string, which would be tied to the cadaver with the bell kept above ground. This was so that if somebody was buried alive, they'd be able to ring the bell, and the Gravekeeper would have been able to set them free. And of course, another N64 classic is Super Smash Bros. Goddamn, Smash is amazing, and nobody would have guessed how big this franchise would have become based on this first title. This initial entry into the franchise crossover series established Mario's fighting moveset, including a variety of special moves. These moves are based on the Shoto style of fighting game character, the general all-rounder, but more specifically than that, his primary selection of special moves are all in reference to Ryu from Street Fighter. Mario's attacks mirror those of Ryu, such as his Hadouken-like fireball attack with his neutral special, a jumping uppercut similar to Shoryuken in his up special, or a spinning tackle similar to Ryu's Tatsumaki Senpukyaku in his down special, the Mario Tornado. Mario's moves would evolve and adapt to be less Shoto-esque as the Smash game franchise went on, but alongside this, Ryu himself would also go on to be added into the Smash series, making his debut in Super Smash Bros. for Nintendo 3DS and Wii U. It's been almost 40 years since it was introduced, but the NES has continued to be a relevant part of the gaming space. People can't get enough of the fresh ideas that were born in the 8-bit era thanks to Nintendo's incredibly well-planned system, with its at least, for the time, developer-friendly approach to creating games. Their own titles during this era are some of the most iconic franchises to this day, and for good reason. With their deceptively simple appearance, refined with a ridiculous volume of polish, games like Kid Icarus, Zelda, Mother, Kirby, Super Mario Bros. 3, these have all made an impact. These are titles that many of us would happily pick up and play at any time of day just to get a short burst of simple and pristine fun. And we'll be discussing these games in this episode, as well as more revealing secrets in games that are older than most of our audience and us, since we're all young and ever so handsome, obviously. But first off, we're going to start with some good old-timey Super Mario Bros. 2. This second entry of Super Mario Bros. recognized one element of what made the original Super Mario so great. It's horizontal screen scrolling, a revolutionary and truly fundamental mechanic. For the second entry, Nintendo didn't want to have just horizontal screen scrolling, but also vertical scrolling, introducing a whole new way and a whole new dimension in which the player must navigate the bizarre scenery of the game. To make it clear that this was a new feature of the game, the first screen in which the player takes control immediately drops them from a door into a falling state, so the player can easily recognize that falling off the bottom of a screen may not result in immediate death. But this does introduce a question, one to which there'd been no answer, but remained in the minds of many players. If the player's character is falling out of the sky, out of a door, what is on the other side of that door? This is a question that would have been impossible to answer around the game's release on the NES, because there was no method of landing in front of the door or opening it. That is until the modern age of reverse engineering and modifying old game code. If a solid platform is hacked into the game, just below the door, and the player attempts to enter it, a shocking result occurs. The player will respawn back to where they started, though the hacked-in platform will be removed. 
forcing progress to take place. This isn't just true for the original NES release of the game, however, but also true for the Game Boy Advance release. From one Nintendo classic to another, and this time, rather than answering a question, it's a hidden feature that was overlooked by many players of this cult franchise, Kid Icarus. The game had a hidden feature that enabled Pitt to actually haggle with shopkeepers to lower the prices of the store's items. This is done through the use of the second controller attached to the NES system by simultaneously pressing both the A and B buttons. For the Japanese Famicom release, the secret is even more obscure. The microphone built into the system's second controller is used instead of pressing A and B, with players having to speak into the mic to haggle. The main catch to haggling in the game is that the price of items will only be successfully lowered if Pitt's offensive strength is one point higher than the first number of the stage that he is currently on when attempting to haggle. So having two points of strength when haggling on stage one, for example, would lead to a good result. If this condition isn't met, the shopkeeper will of course raise the price of the items instead. However, these prices will not change until the shopkeeper's text has finished scrolling across the screen, so there will be a small window of opportunity to still get the item at the right price before he tries to gouge you. This feature was even introduced into the 3DS Classics port, where instead of using a non-existent second controller, the player can haggle using the A button and pressing either Start or Select. Some NES secrets don't just appear within the game themselves, but within the instruction manuals. Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, had a curious situation when it was published in France, without actually receiving a translation into French, at least not fully. Instead, the game was published entirely in English, but with a translated manual and an additional secondary booklet which translated most of the game's text. Pretty rough for kids back in the day, who would spend half their time looking at the screen and half the time staring at the book just to know what the villagers were saying, even if what they say is massively confusing, like the classic I am error situation. And this wasn't the only time a game was published in France without an in-game localization. In fact, many NES games were released in Europe only in English, and sometimes they didn't even have a translation manual. Another interesting game on the NES is Star Tropics. Both this game and its sequel were exclusive to the West, never having a release in Japan, and the second game only made it to Europe thanks to the Wii U Virtual Console. The NES release of the first game actually included a letter inside the game's packaging from the in-game character Dr. Jones. This is the basis of one of the biggest hurdles of kids back in the day. During the events of the game, Dr. Jones will tell you to dip the letter into water, though many assumed that this was a reference to an in-game item. You can imagine the confusion this caused as a result. The player actually needed to physically dip the letter included in the box into water in order to reveal a secret code written in invisible ink, something which many players would be reluctant to do, and we're pretty sure we would all be too. This led to Nintendo Power getting involved, where they published the code that the player was supposed to take from this letter, 747, in their Counselor's Corner section, which was created to help players who got stuck in games. For the game's digital release on the Wii Virtual Console, this of course became impossible, so the code was instead added to the game's manual, which displays a short animation of the letter being dipped into a bucket before revealing the code. On the Wii U, the animation was removed, and it was simply explained that the original release involved physically dipping a letter, and the Nintendo Switch release just doesn't include any digital alternative, and as a result, makes progressing impossible without having to look online. Another curiosity involves an item which features in the game, the Island Yo-Yo. This name was met with some complications over the years as a result of the word Yo-Yo being copyrighted in Canada. This meant that the item needed to be renamed when it came to a digital release, so it was changed to the Island Star in order to avoid any infringement. Yet another interesting fact can be found in the game's sequel, Zoda's Revenge, Star Tropics 2. When the player finds the pizza delivery person in the middle of the desert in the game's third chapter, they'll be riding a turtle which strongly resembles a Koopa Trooper from the Super Mario series. Quite a sly homage, if you ask us. One game with an interesting international story is Mother, the game that came before the massively popular Earthbound. This title originally only saw a release in Japan, but a US release was intended at one stage, with localization work having been completed to remove content unsuitable for the West, and translating the game's text into English. 14 years after the Japanese release of the game on the Famicom, Nintendo re-released the game in Japan alongside Earthbound in the Mother 1 and 2 compilation for the Game Boy Advance. 
Though this Japanese exclusive release is a curious one because the version of Mother included on the cart was actually the then unreleased American NES localized version of the game, which had then been translated back into Japanese. We know this because of the censorship changes made to the game, as well as the addition of a new ending, at least to Japanese fans, that was included in the then unreleased English version. Another change is that the movement on the game's overworld is not tile-based, and instead allows for more fluid movement similar to Earthbound, as well as the SMASH icon having its palette fixed, stopping it from taking on the colours of whatever enemy the player is currently facing. Another change is that the sing command is only usable in the final battle of the game, while in the original, the player could use it in any battle so long as Nintendo's party had already sung the eight melodies to Queen Mary. One more NES title that had regional differences is Little Nemo, the Dream Master. This revolutionary title let the main character ride a reptile months before Super Mario World even released, and even gave players a choice on which creature they'd mount. One of the rideable creatures in the game is Gorilla, which appears to be a perfectly normal gorilla in the North American and European versions of the game. In the Japanese game, however, this gorilla quite likes to smoke the odd cigar. The character Flip would also smoke cigars in the Japanese game, but the two characters had to give up their habit for their international debut. Despite this, however, the game's manual in Western regions still features artwork of the gorilla and a smoking cigar. And the gorilla's sprite still has curled lips as if it were holding the cigar in its mouth. Speaking of alterations to a game, Kirby's Adventure has an absolute ton of content that was cut before the game received its release. According to the Kirby's Dream Collection Celebration booklet, a number of ideas were removed from the game entirely, which would have seen the player able to dig holes, turn invisible, multiply, and even turn into a puddle of water. Most of these ideas never made it past the initial planning and sketching phase, though an unused ability does appear to still be in the game's data. The graphics for a mini Kirby can be found, which would suggest that the game was set to allow the player to become tiny, similar to an ability which would appear in a much later entry of the Kirby series, Kirby and the Amazing Mirror. Because of where these graphics are found in the NES game's data, it's speculated by many that this ability wound up being replaced by the UFO ability. More unused graphics can even be found showing an unused seventh stage door, suggesting that there is an original plan to have seven stages in at least one of the game's main hubs. Though in the final release, the most stages a hub area contains is six. Oddly, one piece of unused data is technically still used in the final release, there was originally a cannon icon that would appear whenever Kirby was on a cannon. And while it was cut from the game for its original purpose, the cannon icon can still be seen when using the mix ability. During the roulette section of abilities, the cannon icon can still be seen, though it's unlikely any real human would have noticed this without the use of frame by frame advancement. Though, as a slight curiosity, for some reason this icon takes on its original purpose in only the French release of the game, and nobody knows why. And now it's time for some trivia from the NES game that we get asked about the most by far, Super Mario Bros. 3. You may already know that the whistle sound effect in the game comes from The Legend of Zelda. But this isn't the only audio reference in Mario 3. The Tanuki Mario transformation sound effect actually originates from the mysterious Murasame Castle. A Japan-only Nintendo game made with the same engine as the original Legend of Zelda and released two full years before Mario 3. There's a great region long video on that. It's the first one I ever did if you want to cringe an old voiceover. Another secret in the game is that for some reason, the hammer suit item that pops out of a large question block appears to actually be a toad suit. The other items, the frog and tanuki suits, actually match their inventory sprites. So several sleuths have posed the question, why is one different and not matching? Though it was fixed in the Super NES and Game Boy Advance remakes. It's worth noting that in the original game, the hammer suit is something of a secret power-up, as it only shows up in hidden areas and randomly from toad houses. Though in later versions, it is made to consistently appear in certain toad houses. This could be why the outfit appears to be a toad when small, but even this seems a bit nonsensical since all the other small suit sprites match their larger suit sprites. So yeah, it's a mystery. 
It was a simpler time back in the mid 2000s. If things were tough, you could just reach over for the perfect tool to help you de-stress, playing Nintendogs on the Nintendo DS. This compact bad boy boasted two screens, that's twice as many as a television in case you didn't know, and it could even fold for supreme portability. The console wasn't exactly pushing graphics to the next level, but that wasn't what was needed when you had games designed around the system's unique features. Or games that were just designed to be great. Mario Party and Kart DS, Nintendogs and the DS Zelda titles certainly used the system's unique qualities, but then Chrono Trigger or Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, not so much. And that doesn't mean they aren't bloody brilliant. For our first piece of trivia, we're going to be taking a look at a game that made a little bit less of a splash than the rest of these, despite still being pretty decent. Glory of Heracles. This title is part of a series, but this release is the only one to be published outside of Japan. Originally owned by Data East and sold off after the company filed for bankruptcy, the franchise was bought by both Nintendo and Paon, co-owning the copyright between them. This meant that the game was able to introduce some fun references to other Nintendo titles. Just like when the game's hero is trying to come up with an alias for himself, where one of the names suggested for him is Pit, in reference to Kid Icarus. Though this quote doesn't even sound Greek, so it is dismissed. Another reference pops up in the forest where an earth nymph will say, hee hee, this path, it's secret to everybody, referencing the popular phrase from the Zelda series. And when the town of Heaven's Haven is destroyed, talking to an item shopkeep, she will respond, buy something and support my rebuilding plans, will ya? Another Zelda nod, referencing the phrase, buy something, will ya? Spoken by the merchant in Zelda 1. Another nod can be found when the party attempts to sneak aboard the Trantian giant horse headed for Troy, and Princess Piazza will lie to get the party passage on board. I am Princess Piazza, representative of Trantia's ally nation of, um, Arcania. The name of this nation, Arcania, is actually the homeland of Marth from Fire Emblem. Nintendo loves referencing their other games, but it isn't too often that they reference their literal selves, the people behind the company and the games. In Nintendogs, however, when walking your dog, it's possible to bump into a random dog walker named Shiggy and his dog, Pick. As you might have guessed, this is actually Shigeru Miyamoto, along with his real-life dog, Piku, which makes this reference rather sweet and a bit meta in some ways, as Pick was actually the inspiration for the whole game's creation. Before Spirit Tracks, there was of course another Zelda on DS, Phantom Hourglass. References to earlier Zelda titles can be found throughout the game, including the character of King Muto, who shares his name with Muto, the carpenter boss from Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and the Minish Cap. Not only that, but the other carpenters from these games and the Cobble Knights from Phantom Hourglass are very similar. Bremor, Brent, Doyle, and Mac in Minish Cap, Bremure, Brant, Doylan, and Max in Hourglass. There's more interesting secrets behind the characters' names in Phantom Hourglass, though sometimes these might not be so obvious. Bellum is the main antagonist of the game, a squid-like creature, while Linebeck, captain of the SS Linebeck Steamboat, serves as a companion to Link to guide him through the world. At one stage in the game, Linebeck becomes possessed and must be defeated. It is this possessed form that has an unseen name, referred to as Bellumbeck in the game's official guide. Though the name can also be found within the game's code, suggesting it is in fact his name in this state, but the developers simply forgot to insert the boss's name when the battle begins. Bellum is actually an interesting character alone, particularly his relationship with the Ocean King. The contention between them may be a reference to the natural conflict between sperm whales and squid, with Bellum taking the appearance of a squid, while the Ocean King's true form being that of a whale. Some of the DS's ports introduced intriguing new elements, be them intentional or not, like with Chrono Trigger, which made one particularly challenging element of the game slightly easier thanks to what is likely a bug. Towards the end of the game, the player can choose to battle the Dream Devourer found at the darkness at the end of time, a boss which boasts a staggering 32,000 hit points. However, this invokes a slight oddity, as the game's HP value is stored in the code as a 16 signed integer, meaning that it cannot be any higher than 16 bits, with one of those bits indicating the sign of the number it represents. This is a little complicated if you don't know about how computers calculate number values, but suffice it to say, it's possible to wreck this boss by helping him out, and the game won't know what to do. 
After fighting this boss and getting past the first phase of the battle, the second phase initiates with the Dream Devourer absorbing magic, resulting in magic damage healing the boss rather than harming it. This is where the Tech Brain comes into play, by making the boss soak up an absolute ton of healing, giving it more health than it initially started with, it's possible to push the boss's health above 32,767, the maximum HP limit in the game. This results in the game's health count being above its limit, and so it will overflow and loop back to the beginning again. This means that the boss will ultimately heal up past its upper limit and breach the lower limit, healing to a negative number. As the boss is then read as having less than zero health, the battle will end, and the boss will be determined as dead. Though we suppose it's more like more alive than it can handle. Staying on the subject of great DS games that don't make too much use of the DS's unique features, there's a fairly refined secret within Mario Kart DS that was never used, though it can be reinserted. The code in question can be found in the game and re-enabled through the use of a cheat code, which utilizes display capture and blurs the player's screen whenever they use a boost to give the illusion of speed. The final game does actually try to enable this effect, but because the blur doesn't initialize, it winds up not being displayed. The code makes use of a coprocessor utilized in the game's multiplayer modes, so while it can be enabled, it is unlikely that the code would have worked in anything other than single player modes. Why the code went unused is unknown, but inconsistency across single player and multiplayer modes would have been a contributing factor, along with the fact that it could have been considered too distracting. More references can be found in another Mario game on DS, Mario Party DS. This time around, the reference can be found in the minigame Goomba Wrangler, and is a nod to another game created by Nintendo, Pokemon Ranger, a spin-off of the Pokemon series. The game involved the player drawing circles around Pokemon to capture them, similar to Goomba Wrangler. The French name for this minigame actually serves as a fairly on-the-nose reference to Pokemon Ranger, with it being called Goomba Ranger. Another interesting part of the European release of the game came with the website which listed the game's various boards. Wiggler's Garden was given a different name, being listed as P.T. Piranha's Greenhouse. While this original name may appear to make sense, with it featuring a piranha plant at the top of the board, it falls short when you realise that P.T. Piranha doesn't actually appear in the game at all. Never mind the fact that the board is clearly based on a garden, and really doesn't look like a greenhouse. And now, we make our way to the inevitable, talking about Pokemon for a Nintendo handheld. Heart Gold and Soul Silver are some much beloved entries in the franchise, and with them came a number of new Pokemon designs, some of which were never actually seen. One of the designs that does appear is a spiky-eared Pichu, which requires the player to have obtained a Pikachu-colored Pichu from an event in a copy of Pokemon Diamond or Pearl, and then trade it to Heart Gold or Soul Silver as to unlock a unique event. But this spiky-eared Pichu was originally supposed to be a white variation of Pichu, but this was changed during development thanks to Shoko Nakagawa, the Japanese voice actress for Spiky Pichu. In her autobiography titled Shoko Nakagawa, Pokemon Taught Me the Meaning of Life, Nakagawa claims, So originally, spiky-eared Pichu was going to be white Pichu instead. And I heard they were even thinking about making a brand of white cream stew to go along with it and everything. But they eventually went with spiky-eared Pichu instead. The white stew in question was likely a product to sell as a pun on white Pichu's Japanese name, as it sounds very similar to white stew, Hawaito Pichu, and Hawaitu Sichu. The change from a white Pichu to a spiky Pichu, however, is the result of Nakagawa often making a spelling mistake in her blog where she will accidentally use the word spiky like she is saying spiky happy instead of mega happy, inspiring Game Freak to use this concept for Pichu and have Nakagawa be the voice of the new creation. Did you know? 
During the Wii U's development, possibly none of Nintendo's senior staff were aware of how Xbox Live or the PlayStation Network functioned. An unnamed third-party developer told Eurogamer that working with the Wii U prior to launch, and working with Nintendo in general, was a rather trying experience. Nintendo had issues setting up a large network infrastructure like Xbox Live, even after announcing their online platform and its features. The developer explained, This was surprising to hear. We probed a little deeper and asked how certain scenarios might work with the Mii friends and networking, all the time referencing how Xbox Live and PSN achieved the same thing. At some point in the conversation, we were informed that it was no good referencing Live and PSN, as nobody in their development teams used those systems. The apparent reason for the Day 1 patch on the Wii U was that most of the network features on the OS weren't even on the console yet. Everything regarding the development process leading up to the launch ran slower than expected. Their team received multiple dev kits up until launch, which is standard procedure, but the kits were colored differently and didn't include clear explanations as to how they were different from earlier versions, outside of the obvious hardware adjustments. When issues running the actual game on the Wii U arose, they reported to Nintendo support, but the team ended up having to wait around a week to get a reply for each report thanks to time zones and translation issues. The Expresso multi-chip module microprocessor utilized in the Wii U offloads some of the troubles from the CPU onto other chips, but due to how different this was from existing systems like the Xbox 360 and PS3, the team didn't know how to properly make use of the feature and compensate for the underpowered CPU. The Wii U's hardware development cycle was completed in four years, having started just two years after the Wii released. The Wii U team experimented with a second screen very early on, before solidifying the concept of the console. They affixed the screen to the end of the Wii zapper to simulate the screen moving one-to-one -one with the player's movements. Two developers who worked on Wii Sports and Resort, Takayuki Shimomura and Yoshikazu Yamashita, were exploring ideas from Wii Sports to find new angles for the Wii U. Shimomura said, We tested gameplay that involved moving the Wii zapper and having images from the Wii move in sync on the monitor in your hands. It was fairly well received. The team was almost immediately taken with the concept. Before it could be applied to the Wii U, Miyamoto decided the idea worked best for the 3DS in the form of the built-in gyro sensor for the handheld, which was in the final stages of development at the time. Shimomura added, Thanks to this prototype, however, we were able to explain the structure of the Wii U, having a screen in your hands, and it being more compelling. With the Wii Zapper prototype no longer in play, the team moved on to a new prototype model. The model was simply an LCD screen with two Wii remotes fixed to either side. Initially, the gamepad's design was much more reminiscent of handheld tablet devices. It featured circle pads instead of analog sticks, and the whole device was flat, opposed to the final design which has a protrusion on the back and grips on either side. The Wii U's outward appearance was motivated by the same idea of the Wii. This explains the initial minimalistic flat design that made it seem as though it belonged in the living room. Nintendo hardware developer Masato Ibuki spoke about developing the gamepad. We didn't know how tacking grips on the back of a square pad-like device would make it easier to hold, so we made a bunch of designs. I carved them by hand, adjusted them with clay, did that day after day for a long time. Went to have it checked by those involved, and got told it was difficult to hold. No matter how perseverant you are, that may break your heart. I thought, come on, this is pretty good, isn't it? But they flat out said it wasn't, so we repeated that process. I think that was the hardest time for me. Nintendo made roughly 30 software prototypes for the Wii U while still using the work-in-progress gamepad. The programs ran through two Wii consoles, which were used as simulations for the Wii U. These software prototypes led to the idea for a Nintendo theme park, which eventually became one of the Wii U's launch titles, Nintendo Land. Miiverse is a sort of spiritual successor to the Japanese Wii channel called Wii no Ma. The channel was billed as a living room communication channel, which allowed users to shop, watch on-demand video content, and featured a variety of entertainment channels. According to Miiverse director Kiyoshi Mizuki, we updated it every day. But depending on the users on the receiving end, sometimes they would find what we distributed to be interesting, and sometimes it wasn't. So it was very challenging to try and satisfy everyone with a limited amount of content we could produce. So instead of making everything ourselves for users to enjoy, we thought that we could maybe set up user-generated content so that more people could participate. Then Nintendo president Satoru Iwata referred to the concept as an empathy network. The entire program was designed to elicit empathy between its users. This is why instead of the commonly implemented system of likes used in most social networks, Miiverse uses yes, and the posts are attached to a specific game for the purposes of shared interest. When you turn on the Wii U, the main screen is called Wara Wara Plaza, but originally it was called Mi Wara Wara. The idea of having Mii's come out and bustle around in a crowd, or Wara Wara, came from the 3DS Street Pass Mii Plaza lacking any social experience outside of the actual act of street passing. The developers behind the Dolphin GameCube and Wii emulator reverse-engineered the Wii U gamepad in an attempt to get the Wii U emulator working on PC. Pierre Pordon told Eurogamer, We started working on the Wii U gamepad as soon as we got our hands on it. The gamepad is actually not a very secure device 
device compared to the Wii U. The device firmware is stored in an unencrypted flash, which allowed us to reverse engineer the binary code pretty easily. It's also using almost standard 802.11n, which made things easier to experiment on PC. We also found the system can support two Wii U gamepads simultaneously. This is actually built into the system's firmware, implying Nintendo were going to use this feature, or at least allow other developers to use it. There are a few fun easter eggs featured within the Wii U's menus. When game data is transferred from the Wii to the Wii U, the icons of the transfer data are carried by Pikmin. The Mii Maker music features the Great Fairy Fountain theme, as well as the theme to Super Mario Bros. 3 Waterland. On top of this, if you access the Warra Warra Plaza on your birthday, music will play and your Mii's will clap for you. Did you also know that the Japanese version of Super Mario RPG has a ton of references to anime? Or that there's a hidden secret within Earthbound that took decades to find? For a whole bunch of SNES facts, check out the video on screen. <laughs> 